be looking after a new series for BBC Two and a race against time. We've taken over two identical One of England's oldest family estates is teetering on the edge of financial ruin. Something's got to be done. The income from this sort of place uh, doesn't balance the uh, expenditure. To reverse the 600-year-old estate's decline, the son and heir has come up with a risky scheme to drag his family into the 21st century. It's got to work very well, this project, financially, for visitor numbers, people buying plants, admission fees, all that sort of thing. Then we're in trouble, you know. Um, it has to work. Tom Hartdyke's plan is to turn this acre of weed-filled, overgrown walled garden into a tourist attraction that will bring in 50,000 visitors a year. But it's going to be a painful process. That's <laughs> oh, brilliant. There's an orchard there. There's an orchard. You can't just say the boundaries where I want it to well, be. Goodness. Don't bloody talk to anyone. OK. Don't bloody do anything. Don't say anything. That we're now right down to the bottom of the barrel and there's literally just no more money left. The guy in particular has never borrowed this sort of amount of money. I'm money where it's not at all dreadful mistake, frankly. You would have to work very hard to convince me that anyone with the word architect in their title wasn't actually the spawn of Satan. There's too much stress in all this. If your father does not go with the business plan, the Hart Dykes are going to lose Lullingston Castle. Lullingston Castle is set in 120 acres of lush Kent countryside, just 17 miles from central London. The manor of Lullingston was in the Doomsday Book. Frequently visited by royalty, Henry VII held jousting tournaments here back in the late 15th century. 500 year old helmet, which is a pretty good nick really. There used to be two, but I think one was sold off by the family soon after the war to raise funds to put on a new roof. Lullingston's been handed down through the same family for centuries. Today, Guy Hartdyke is the 19th generation to inherit the castle. The estate was divided up just after the war, and my brother got the title, and I got this place. I've never been quite sure since who got the best bargain. So have you got lots of staff now still going? Oh! We have one lady that comes in two hours a week. You do about now, actually. In a house this size, though, two hours a week doesn't go very far. But in my grandfather's time, of course, they had 12 indoor staff and four living in outdoor staff. Most of the domestic work falls on the shoulders of Guy's wife, Sarah, a state of affairs the visitors are often surprised by. And they just think I'm one of the people in for the day, you know? What do they pay you, sort of thing? Um, until perhaps they see the photograph on the piano and then they might connect. And people are very kind. They say you haven't changed <laughs> since the 1974 um, sort of wedding picture. Guy and Sarah Hartdyke have to work hard to keep the house in good enough condition to open to the public. Barrel water seating, Elizabethan. They've got one at Hever Castle, which is pathetic beside this, I think. And you can see the Queen at the time, there she is. Queen Anne looking down upon you, seeing you don't nick anything. Um, the tragedy, particularly in this family, is that my grandfather actually never made a proper will. He wrote a bit of, on a bit of paper that everything was to be left to his wife, and his wife only survived him by a matter of months. So when my father inherited, he had not one estate duty to pay, but double. And to do that, he had to sell up most of the estate. Most of the land went for 30 bob an acre, one pound 50. One acre of Orpington, I think I could retire on today. I mean, on the face of it, it looks to be in a good state of repair, the house. But actually, um, there's plenty that needs doing. You know, you've got all this um, giving ourselves away, but you see all this 
rot situation. Um, and presumably, so it's just too costly to restore. Well, it is, and you know, a, a timber treatment um, opinion would be, well, you know, you'd need to rebuild the house. I mean, there's not a lot you can do. It's a wonderful, wonderful struggle, but uh, uh, we think it's worth it. It's mid-May and the castle is open for the summer season. This should be their busiest time of the year, and with visitor numbers lower than ever, they've decided to open not just on Saturday and Sunday, but Friday as well. How many people so far today, Guy? Uh, absolutely nil. What's it now? 20 past one. And three and a half hours to go. <clears throat> Very good day, it's about 100 people. Um, 120 people, something of that sort. Pretty average day is about 40 to 50. Guy, does it worry you standing here without any paying visitors coming in? Oh, well, it becomes philosophic. Um, but it's nicer sitting here <laughs> mowing the lawns and weeding the paths and all the other many tasks that uh, fall to the lot. The squire who can't uh, really support a labour force. It can't go on the way it's going. So um, now's a chance to sort of get on, make the next move and be the bridge for that. On most open days, a local volunteer called Reg mans the gate. Not very busy yet. The word hasn't got around. Then this is the first, first day we've opened on a Friday. But we're hoping crowds will pick up later on. For Guy and Sarah, even three open days a week is practically a full-time job. We're thoroughly untrained in every possible way, I think, here. We just do as we can and are able. Uh, but I do love arranging flowers. Um, probably better than cleaning the loos, which I did this morning. I was up bright and early. Um, I mean, every job is, is OK. It's a question of attitude, isn't it? <laughs> and it's not just the work. There's a balancing act between earning income and keeping the house in good repair. It is wear and tear on the house. I'm very aware in, in here in the hall of two lovely runners, they're 18th century, and they're, they're good. Um, we only had one repaired at one stage a few years ago and not the other. If it were me, I would have said, let's do them both. But, but it's, it's for us, you know, I mean, we're inviting people in, they're paying money to come in, and it's for us to protect ourselves and the carpets. <laughs> Two prospects, a man and a woman. They're certainly interested. Reg has got them spellbound. He's very good lesser in passing the trade. And scare them away by appearing at the door. <laughs> Quite often they say, no, we just want to go see the church. Which, of course, they don't need any tickets for. The House of God being open every day. The House of Art Day going on Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. We don't despair. They might come out of the church and come to see us later, but uh, can't win them all. <laughs> right, we'll have a bit of lunch, I think, now. <laughs> With visitor numbers in terminal decline, bankruptcy is beckoning. And it looks like 600 years of history is coming to an abrupt end. But there could be a saviour at hand. 28-year-old Tom Hartdyke is the son and heir, and is next in line to inherit what has become a financial millstone. A fanatical gardener, he's come up with an unusual and ambitious idea, which he hopes will transform the estate and turn Lullingston into a major tourist attraction. They build up regulators. regulators. But Tom is an unlikely heir to save Lullingston. But you can't be any jeans off the street. Gotta be handy with the steel if you know what I mean. Okay, let's go. Regulators! 
His horticultural methods raise a few eyebrows in conventional gardening circles. Warren G, he's just he's got the edge on Puff Daddy, and he's just he's just the guy. He just induces them into germination, yeah, and, and prevents rob rotting at the base of the seed pod. And Pavarotti and Dire Straits cause rotting of the seed pod. <laughs> Germination! <laughs> Tom is an obsessive plant hunter. He even lectures about his travels around the world in search of rare and exotic species. Or labellum is here. Often modified, it's a landing platform for the insect. But in the year 2000, his passion for plant hunting nearly killed him. The Darien Gap was where these orchids were growing, and me and Paul thought, Let's do it. You have to walk this area. His trip to Central America was one he will never forget. Paul Winder from Essex and Tom Hart Dyke from Kent were taken hostage at gunpoint as they trekked through a notoriously dangerous region. The two young men were to spend nine months in captivity. They made this house for us, this palm house, divided it into two and just incarcerated me and Paul on each side of it. So we weren't allowed to talk or anything. Um, even murmured to each other and he got his rotting leg and the worms came and maggots and stuff and he was just you know crapping and pissing in his bed so I had to try and clean all the stuff off his bed and things and um, if they let me and he was just in well, that's the worst way he's ever been in his life. Every day the gorillas threatened the boys with execution. As a distraction Tom started a secret diary. I was quite nervous when I was writing it because they keep inspecting you, the guards, with all their guns at sort of every ten minutes. So <laughs> you write a sentence and you have to close the diary, you have to hide it under your, your cover and then wait for them to go and pretend you're not doing anything. Then you have to do it and then stop and they come back again. Back home again after nine months as hostages Today, in the two Colombian... Two British jungle. botanists arrive home after enduring a kidnapping that's left British officials... Something extraordinary came out of the depths of the jungle. To escape the horror of his situation, he started thinking how to go about revitalizing the fortunes of the estate he might never live to see again. I guess it was sort of, I don't know, it's just, I suppose that shows you what I wanted to do, my last days or whatever, but and it kept me, the, the, the thing with it, it really kept me sane, if you can, kept me kept sane in those sort of conditions. Thinking about home and what I want to do at home sort of delayed, and just there, delayed any thoughts of dying, anything like that. Four years after his eventual release, these scribbled drawings and notes are forming the basis of the plans for the estate's revival. The heart of it being a world map with plants. Where people can walk around the different countries, continents around the world, seeing plants in those particular places. It will be the first ever world map with seas, oceans, plants from all over the world. In its heyday in the 1950s, 50,000 people a year visited Lullingston to see the herb garden and a silk farm. Today, despite the family's best efforts, the silk farm is no more, and the garden is a shadow of its former self. Almost no one comes to see it. Tom wants to rip out the old herb garden and build his world map of plants, showing where all the exotic plants we use in our gardens originally came from. It'll be a three-dimensional horticultural spectacular, and for the estate, it can't come soon enough. But it's Tom's father who runs the estate. Before he can do anything, he's got to persuade his dad that his plan is going to work. In his flat in the gatehouse, he's preparing to pitch. This afternoon, at about two o'clock, I'm going to the house. He's not coming up to here. I'm going on his territory, <laughs> his pad, to put forward my um, quite drastic plans for Lullingston. Demolishing the, the herb garden is quite a, it's quite a thing. He, 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 you know, he likes to keep things as they are, quite, you know, same, same. I think Dad will be, I think he'll be fine with it. Honestly, I think he'll be fine with it. The world map will probably bring a few smiles of like, I think, is it really going to work? So we shall see. an interactive world map. Right. There'll be South America, South Africa, Australasia. Mm -hmm. So, and you'll have plants from that area around the world actually growing there indigenously, if you like. And there'll be walkways around the world, and there'll be actually oceans here that you right. can get boat rides mm -hmm. around. 
Uh, it's quite, it's you'll have to find plants that exi can exist in this sort of awful climate. And can. I know. That, yeah, that, that, that is an issue. Um, we can have them uh, in the greenhouse in the winter and put them in sunken pots in the summer. And how, how are the people going to travel around these various countries, Tom? Well, that's what I was thinking. They're going to a balloon or what? Uh, well, well, I was thinking, funny you should mention it. Actually, this project may not only save the castle, but also allow Guy to integrate Tom into the running of the estate. And then, of course, the maintenance after the whole thing's completed. Yeah, you need, no, you've, you've got, got to think that out. It's the cost of labour that's... Uh, uh, I know, that is expensive. That worries me. So, I mean... Yeah, once it's up and running, then we've got to keep it up and running. Absolutely, not only that, but also make a profit. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Tom has no idea how much his garden project will cost. It'll be a big risk, but the estate's in trouble and the family has no alternative. Well, I think it's a great adventure, you know. Um, whether it's practicable or not, is, uh, it, it has to, to be seen, you know, as it develops. But. Uh, Something's got to be done um, because uh, the income from this sort of place uh, doesn't balance the uh, expenditure. Having been around for so long, we wouldn't want to be the generation, as, as guys often said, that sells or tries to sell. You know, we need to go on. And Tom is the lifeline. The estate simply doesn't have the capital for this scale of project, so all funds will have to come from outside. The main thing is getting sponsors interested. That's the big thing, getting the money. Because it's going to cost a lot of money. Guy says yes. Tom's first step is to share his plans with various contacts from the horticultural world to see if they think his sketches will ever make it off the page. In Antarctica, I'm going to fit in this one, one, one acre, the entire world. I want Australia here. I want up through to Siberia on this side. And you've yeah. got a bridge to Tierra Fuego, a bridge yeah. to Cape Town, a bridge to Tasmania. Great Britain's going to be here, so we're just carving around Great Britain with Livingston on, on the map, the Arctic. I want the Americas down here, twirling around with a twist in Chile. Very educational, very interactive, and uh, we're world first. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Prop Haven is about 50 to 60 pounds a metre. It's going to be um, a significant, a significant cost just to put the paths down. If you're going to use it as a way of bringing money into the estate, you have to make sure that it's not going to end up being the drain on the estate yeah, sure. in the end. Sure. That, that wisteria is one plant, and that's as big as Australia, isn't it? I, I don't think he's thought things out completely, and I think uh, a lot of it he's making up as he goes along, and he's, he's got uh, a long way to go. It's just a dream at the moment. There has to be a heavy dose of reality at this stage, otherwise the whole thing isn't going to work. At the end of a long day, Tom is having doubts that his world map of plants can work in the one-acre walled garden. Whales? No, wait a minute. Uh-huh, that's no worries. Spit whales there. But basically, I mean, I've had some serious advice today. I think it was a good plan to just, just start thinking about the size of things. It's a bit, bit, bit of a joke with all the actual scale of things, but I thought Great, Great Britain would be a good place to, uh, a good play, place to start. So there's East Anglia, Scotland. Wales and uh, Cornwall. I've got to come up with a clear mission statement about what I'm going to do and what I'm going to achieve here. It's somehow involving um, how important plants are um, for, for the human race to keep us going on this planet and how diverse they are from country to country. And then we've just got to get on with uh, creating a bloody good business plan for Christmas, basically. The reality check has bitten deep and hard. Tom has a lot of thinking to do over the coming winter. After six frustrating months of fruitless searching for backing, Tom has realised that he doesn't have the financial skills to attract an investor. He needs professional help and he thinks he's found it in the shape of fundraiser Jim Pettifer and horticulturalist Tony Russell. Both Jim and Tony have extensive experience in raising money and managing tourist attractions. The interior of the castle certainly has what's needed, but Tom is hoping they'll see the potential of the grounds too, 
and help him put together a business plan to raise the finance for the world map. And you'll be going up to Africa, South America, climbing up to the a a a a Andes for a cup of tea. You've got Great Britain up the top there, Arctic Europe, the Australasian area, the Antipodean areas, the New, New Zealand, the mainland, and Tasmania. And yeah. you walk around the world. It's, it's interesting. It's very interesting. You know, it, what, what you need is, is a little map showing people how to get round sure. to it. And then when they get here, just a sign, you know, what sure. you just told yeah. us now. That's a Lots to think about. Yeah. Lots to, to think about. I mean, it's endless, yeah. isn't it, Jim? Yeah. I mean, there's so many if I'm good. honest, when but I first heard about the, uh, the world map idea, I wasn't that. Um, impressed. The but the more yeah. I'm hearing about it, now having seen the site, I begin to realise that there is the potential to develop a quite unique garden in many ways, because if you look at any garden in Britain, even English cottage gardens, probably 80% of the plants in there have come from other parts of the world. And yet how many of us realise that? If it's done well, and if you know Tom is prepared to put the, his back into the PR grind, then um, it could be enormously successful. But the family are going to have to do or be prepared to make sacrifices, do a lot more work than they do at the moment, or pay other people to do it. I believe they're down to about 2,000 visitors a year at the moment. Um, they peaked at about 50,000 a year. Um, and I don't see any reason why we can't get them back up to that sort of number. If we could get them back up to that sort of number in five years, they would have a very healthy business. The family agrees to hire Jim and Tony to help save Lollingston, but it's going to cost two years' worth of current income, almost £70,000. At the first meeting to discuss strategy, it becomes apparent that change is not going to be instantaneous. So with a group like this, where they're saying, uh, I would like to come on Monday the 11th of July, if Monday's not appropriate, what will your response be to, to one like this? Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday or Thursday. Or Thursday. It's a Friday, Saturday. 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 Because, you know, we'll be Pretty running strange. to the ground otherwise. Mm. I mean, even in our humble way now, you know, we need that Monday off. Right. You know, it must yeah. be that way. Yeah. There's also a, a, a sort of, uh, almost a cultural thing, really, in that people expect you to be open. Do they yeah. ever? I mean, today, yeah. we were mm. having a sandwich outside. The family's resistance to further invasion is a setback for Jim and Tony. At the end of the day, if the castle's not open and the gate shut, um, then no one can come and see it. What they plan to do is get more people in on the days they are open. Tony and Jim's first priority is a PR and marketing drive and a design makeover, the first for 30 years. Great, isn't it? The new sign is up just in time. The first fruits of the marketing push, a coachload of sightseers who specially booked a tour of the house, is due any minute. Do you mind opening up the house, Sarah? Do I mind? No, I don't mind because, you know, we've... we have to do it. After getting stuck in traffic on the M25, the coach party eventually arrives. They've booked Guy's tour of the house, but today they're getting a freebie as well. Thanks for all coming to Lullingston. Today's a very special day because you're the first group that's come around to see what will be a garden next time, this time next June, in a completely different state. This the coach tour provides Tom with the perfect opportunity to publicise his plans for the world map. And as they were telling us we were going to die shortly, I thought I'd better draw plans out of the garden for Lunningston, obviously. <laughs> so, uh, follow me. I want it to go well. So, yes, I am a little nervous. Of course I am. <laughs> you can see that I am. <laughs> While Tom's selling a vision, Sarah's getting ready to provide tea and cake for the tour. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> and the ocean, seas, lakes become your pathways and you follow around the world in half an hour, in 20 minutes in a set pattern 